が消えかかるそれがオレンジャー熱い血流れる鋼の Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 40 of For Your Eyes O Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Choriki Sentai O Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of this show and we share our thoughts with you, the listeners. My name is Matt J, and with me as always is my co host and brother Dave. Dave, how are you doing today? Not bad. Not bad. Had a really nice day. Awesome. That's great. I'm, I'm, I don't have any jokes about it. I'm just very glad to hear you had a good day, bud. Yeah, nope. It's cool, cool, cool. Awesome. You know what else is cool? Is that today we are watching episode 40 of Cherokee Sentai Ranger. 40, Dave. Finally out of the 30s. And uh, and you know what that means? There is... This show only goes to episode 48. We have two more months of this show, and then we... Does it... Ri- wow. I, you know, I you've mentioned that to me in the past, but I did forget that it's quite that short. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think it's especially weird coming out of uh, Kaku Ranger, which was particularly long. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is like four full episodes shorter than Cocky Ranger. Maybe more. Yeah, dang. Anyway, wow. uh, yeah, we are like on the home stretch, and this episode really does feel like we're on the home stretch. Yeah, no, it it um it does. It really hammers home that like, hey, this bad boy is about over. Like, right. Like it. We wrapping prom- up. Like things are getting real, real crazy. We promised this was going somewhere. <laughs> It might not have seemed like that for maybe half the show through the middle of it, but we do have an end point in sight. <laughs> there, is, there is a plot to this. We do promise. Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute, Dave, because of course, before that, we have our opening segment, our award-winning opening segment. Uh, Dave, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. Would you like to know what our first star of the week is? I'd love to know what the first star of the week is, Matt. Dave, it is fall. It is fall, finally. I, actually, I, is it officially fall by the time this episode hits? No, it's not, because fall actually... The, the official date for fall is is just done by, like, the calendar. Yeah. So, I think it's October the 1st is the first day of fall. Whenever it's it like, is. It's just the last three months or something. I forget what it is, but it's not... I don't think it's officially fall yet. In any case, it is emotionally fall now. Yeah, it feels like fall. So, which is great uh, because Dave, you know this, and maybe our listeners know this, but I live that jacket lifestyle. Uh, I... Oh wait, no, man, it is. It's totally. It is fall. It started two days ago, Saturday, September the twenty second. Nice, nice, nice. Um, we are in fall. I am a fall boy. Uh, I do love fall. Well, Matt, listen, um, our readers might know this, but we are uh, white guys and we do both have beards. Oh, yeah. So I think we're contractually obligated D- to like fall. Dave, we don't just I don't have, think we're... All... We don't just have beards. We've got scarves, too. We do. I've got more than one scarf. Oh, multiple scarves. And like I said, I have a handful of scarves. I have... A closet full of jackets. I live alone. I have 13 jackets in my front hall closet. All of them are mine. Do you seriously? I counted I mean, there's no reason you would have record. There's no reason you would lie about that. That is a truly impressive number of jackets. I don't have that many. Although, I do have to do... I got a weed. I've got some old jackets that don't fit anymore mm-hmm. and they're kind of worn out and I got to get some new ones. Oh, yeah. That, that definitely is including at least two jackets that aren't really in the rotation. Um, but even so, it's not including my denim jacket, which is not in there for some reason. Uh, so, probably because I don't wear that one much anymore because it doesn't fit as well. It's in great condition. Man, I should... Can I tell you... Can I tell you about my new favorite fall thing? Sure. Um, this is... Listen... I don't, I don't love the pumpkin spice latte. Like, it's not my favorite. Um, they, have like gotten, if somebody sh- they have gotten more sugary over the years. They used yeah, to be more somebody, nutmeggy and all spicy. If somebody showed up and was like, hey, I got you one, I wouldn't, like, throw it in their face. But I'm not going to order it on my own. But what Starbucks has started carrying is a sense of shame about how much money I spend at Starbucks. <laughs> uh, but in addition to that, they have started carrying a, cin- a sugar-free cinnamon flavored syrup and that bad boy makes your latte taste like a warm cinnamon bun and it's very very good mm, that is it's very, very good. 
It is. It's very, very good. Uh, so yeah, man, I love fall. Yeah. And here's the other nice thing about fall for me. Um, and I, I, this is semi not unique to me, of course, but it is peculiar to teaching is that when it's nice out, my brain feels like I shouldn't be working. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. We work in the fall. Like we work when it's cold out. And then when it's like summery out, we don't work. Like that's the deal. And so if when I have to go to work and it's like 85 degrees and sunny, like I recognize that nobody wants to go to work when it's 85 degrees and sunny. But it just like it throws me for a real loop when it's very summery, but I do have to go to work. And yeah. so but when fall hits, it's like, ah, fall. Yes. Now I feel right being at work. Oh yeah, I I can totally understand that. Um Man, here's here's another fall thing. I did not anticipate talking about fall for quite as long as we have. But the other day, for some, uh, it wasn't a completely out of the blue reason, but not worth getting into. I was looking like going Google Street View through Grove City, where you and I went to college. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it was weird because they moved the Rite Aid down the street. Uh, and they closed down the old Pizza Joe's. I think it moved down on Broad Street. It's no longer across from McDonald's. Um, Wait, is that the one where everyone went? Everyone goes to Pizza Joe's? Actually, I think that yeah. was a different Pizza Joe's in town. Was it? Further down the Listen, same street. Um, Pizza Joe's was not good. I did not eat there. No, 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 no. Gaffaro's was the way to go. Uh, Kefaro's used to bring you drinks with your pizza, but it wasn't yeah, like a was bottle nice. of pop. They just had a fountain machine and they would bring you like cups of pop. <laughs> it was a little weird, but there was free Pepsi with your pizza, so cool. Yeah, man, Kefaro's rolled. Uh, anyway, but the day that the Google Street View car drove through Grove City was like this perfect autumn day. And like, man, there is nothing that will make you feel more nostalgic for your college than like doing a virtual walk down the street in like this beautiful fall day. Like it was, I, it, it, it put me on a whole thing all day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, uh, fall's great. I'm trying to be more cold weather and darkness positive this year so I don't get real bummed out in the middle of winter. So I'm trying to get out ahead of it. Uh, yeah, mm, strong. That's a good idea. Anyway, Dave, what is our second star of the week? So our second star of the week, Matt, is weddings. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, as, as aforementioned, we are heading into fall. So this is sort of the like the second half of peak wedding season. Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, I actually didn't know, the because I was at a wedding this weekend, I didn't know you were also at a wedding this weekend. I was also at a wedding this weekend. How was yours? Well, uh, it was really, well, okay. It was, it objectively was a lovely wedding. Uh huh. I did not get to experience a lot of it because the twins were feeling kind of... So we went up to upstate New York, and it was uh, Beth's cousin who was getting married. Okay. And so since the, the twins were feeling kind of under the weather... Oh, I'm sorry. And so, yeah, like they were kind of cranky, and like they didn't want to do a whole lot. And since it was like her cousin, I was like... I, I was doing my best to sort of be like, no, 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 like you sit, like you stay for the ceremony, like I'll take the twins outside and let them like run around so they're not like shrieking in the middle of this service. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a lovely wedding. I didn't get to experience it quite as much of it as I would have liked, um, but it was, it was great. Like everybody was up at Beth's family farm. There was a big tent. There was really good food. We had breakfast for dinner because uh, Bob and Winsome, who was a couple that got married, Bob and Winsome, like, that's what they really dig. So it was like scones and bagels and breakfast sausages nice. and stuff. It was great. Uh, uh, how about you? How was your wedding? Sorry, I was just, I was excited about mine. Yeah. Not my, I mean, I was excited about my wedding when I sure, had it, it's, but that's but not it's, the one it's I'm talking about. It's been a minute. About. Yeah. So, uh, how was the wedding you were at? Uh, Who got married? I assume it's nobody I know. Dude, it was nobody I know. Uh, I was a plus one to this wedding. Huh. Um, and so, I was like... No kidding. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just like rolled into this wedding because a friend of mine was like, Hey, I'm going to a wedding. Uh, I don't have anybody to go with. Let's go to this wedding. So, of course, when somebody says that, what do you do? You buy a new jacket. I was going to say, you throw 13. your suit on and you go to the... <laughs> Uh, that was you go to the thing. that was jacket thirteen. It's very nice. It's blue and it's got leather on the patch or on the elbows. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, How distinguished! And it was really nice. It was a fun 
It was a very fun wedding. It was sort of like a rock and roll wedding a little bit. Like, not all the way. Like, you could tell that there was a stage of the planning where they almost let it get a lot more rock and roll. But the recessional after they had finished the ceremony and were going back down the aisle was definitely too, I believe, in a thing called Love by the Darkness. Well, that is their best song. It is well, okay. It's time for their best song with "Girl with Girl with the Hazel Eyes." I would say, but uh, yeah. also their Christmas song from uh, the uh, Love Actually soundtrack is extremely good. Uh, I will admit that I don't know it, but I believe you. Uh, Christmas time, don't let the bells end. It's super good. Um, Anyways, so I don't think I've ever been to a wedding as just. It's kind of a rando, which, I mean, I love you, but it's exactly what you are. Oh, no, 100%. There was at one point during the, uh, I think it was the groom's speech, where he's like, man, it's so great to look out and see all these people. And I'm like, man, I know everyone in this crowd. I'm like, you, you certainly do not. You probably know, <laughs> you you know 99% not, of this crowd very well, and I am also here. <laughs> <laughs> Just hanging out with your college friends and... Uh, but it was really fun. It was a like it was a very very nice wedding. I don't have a ton else to say about it. There was a big pile of cigars, um, and the, there was a sign next to the pile of cigars that said like the groom's name, like like the groom's names, like uh, like let's say that his name was John. It was not, but let's say that it was. That's a fine name. Uh, it said like John's Cigar Bar, and then underneath it said compliments of the bride. Which I really liked because you know that that was just like, oh yeah, no, we are getting married and so that means that like, I'm marrying you and not your cigars and all of them have to go in one night. (laughs) (laughs) So we're just going to put them out with a pile of nice matchbooks and then you never get to have them again. And you know what? There are a lot of things that when people say like, yeah man, like I got married and then like, you know, my husband or wife didn't like one thing that I did before and so I have changed it. And I feel like the one that I have A lot of the time, that's a little like, oh, come on, man. Like, I I feel like you could have worked that out. Right. If your lady doesn't like cigars... Right. The one time... Or not the one time, mm. because I've heard this a number of times. Like, basically the only instance of this that I am always like, yeah, I get it, is cigars. Yeah, like, if your lady's not into cigars, man, like, you just gotta stop smoking (laughs) cigars. Like, there's no way around that one. Right. It's too much. Because you don't just quick pop out for a cigar. You're there for an hour, and then, it, like, even when the cigar is gone, you are haunted by the ghost of that cigar for three yeah, solid no, you days. you want to done done with that cigar for, yeah, at least a day and a half. Right. It requires either a trip to the laundromat or an exorcism, and, like, you just don't have time for that in your life on the day-to-day. Uh, anyway, Dave, what is our third star of the week? So our third star of the week, Matt, is what I consider some great pieces of Americana, which is, uh, so like I said, I had to go up to upstate New York for this wedding. So we're on the road for a number of hours. Mm-hmm. And you're when you're on the road, you just experience uh, road signs. Not like road signs like, you know, I-86 this way. Uh, advertisements, really. And you see a very different category of advertisement when you're sort of out in the middle of nowhere than you do when you're just like, you know, cruising down I-480 just outside the city. Oh, yeah. Right? 100%. Yeah. So let me uh, let me just say, uh, it's not going to get too crude, but this, this star is like very gently blue. So if that's a concern for you, you may just want to hop forward a hot second. Anyways, Matt. Mm-hmm. So... On the highways and byways of America, there is still a thriving industry of just, uh, let's just call them like intimate adult shops, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how they're still in business, but they appear to be so cool for the proprietors, I guess. And so, which is neither here nor there, uh, but we're driving by and, and we see a sign and the sign has a lady, and she is dressed as, like, a sexy business lady. Okay. And she's holding a tray. And the tray uh, has some uh, intimate lubricants. Okay. Let's put it that way. And, uh, but they're odd colors, Matt. They're sort of like a, like a pastel green and a pastel pink. But, but they have what appears to be a sort of... 
creme ribbon running through them as though they were like a, a pastry or more accurately, like a gelato. Okay. Uh, which, which turned out to be on purpose because this was flavored, intimate lubricant, and, uh, and it was gelato flavored. You know, Dave... Is what the sign touted. I've got... I got at least one problem with this. Do you want to know <laughs> what a, it is? I mean, is it I don't the know why... Made with, is it the gelato is made with, like, a lot of eggs? Is, the gelato is that your problem? gelato is flavor, Dave. Gelato is flavored other things. You get, like... You know, you get coffee-flavored gelato or strawberry-flavored gelato or pistachio-flavored gelato. You never walk up like, hey, give me that gelato flavor. <laughs> That's what I need. Well, man, I need that rich gelato flavor. <laughs> it's just, it was just like there were so many questions. Nobody goes to up be to the asked. gelato place and says, "Give me a plane." <laughs> Give me... <laughs> <laughs> That's not a thing that you can order. And I would just like, okay, listen, man. Um, if you were a per- first of all, normally we say like, hey, if you're the like, get a hold of us. Don't get a hold of us. You just enjoy this one in private. But if you're a person who's just like, oh, yeah, Dave, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, first of all, pro- great, great. I that's, that's wonderful for you. I'm glad that this thing brings you joy. Um, aside from the sort of, like, existential questions about the cons of, like, gelato as a concept and where it intersects with uh, intimate lubricants, I, like, I just... I just don't know. Like, again, like, okay, I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm a married man, so I'm a married man. That's all I'm going to say. Never in my experience have I thought to myself, you know what I can <laughs> really use? Gel- I need some gelato flavor. Okay, here's- I need some, like, Dave- pistachio <laughs> gelato flavor. Here is another... Up in this experience that I'm having right now. Here's another problem I have with this situation. What are the key features? What are the key enticing features of gelato? Is that gelato is real cold. Yeah. Like who in yeah, their white real mind is like, man, you know experience. what I need? You know what flavor I really need? <laughs> up in this is warm gelato. <laughs> warm. Okay, if you've never had gelato, gelato is like ice cream. So it's like heavy cream and then just like a lot of eggs. Yeah. Like it's a it's an eggy ice oh, it's cream. It's a delight. It's almost like a custard. Yeah. It's it's delicious. But yeah, just like I need some warm egg and cream flavor <laughs> <laughs> up up in up in this experience. Nobody's ever said that. Listen, guaranteed somebody has said that. But I mean, someone paid a lot of money for market. that billboard, Dave. I just, it can't be a large enough market to support a niche factory producing gelato flavored lube. I refuse to believe it. Um, so, so leaving that beside, uh, hide, Matt, um, let's talk about bears for a second. Okay. Are, are we moving into our fourth star of the week? Cause I hope we're not still oh, on the third one. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. We okay. are talking about because yeah, I we're, do we're not onto our fourth star. I of the do week. not want to know how gelato lube and bears intersect. Um, just ask CW. I'm sure he could tell you. <laughs> um, anyways, this is another sign that I was that we saw, and you know, like you're out and you're driving through like Seneca Nation territory or like out by the national parks or something, and it'll say like caution. Deer crossing. Sure. Like, hey, you're cruising down the highway at 70 miles an hour. There might be a deer. Just watch out. Right? But normally it says, like, it says the words deer crossing next blank miles. Right? Sure. I'm driving by this. I'm, we're driving down the highway. And we just see, like, a yellow diamond road sign. And it just says 1.5 my. And then there's just a picture, like a a black cutout picture of a bear. Okay. And that was the whole sign. And I just, like, it just took me a minute to register what was happening because, of course, normally, you know, it's like bear crossing or whatever. It's just like, nope, picture of a bear, 1.5 my. 
Watch out for bears. Uh, no, I no. Guess. Okay, now here's my question. Does it mean watch out for bears, or is it being very literal? Like, in 1.5 miles, there is bear. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Or you have, to, or are they warning you about a Fenris style? Like, there's only one, but you really need to watch out. <laughs> Boy, please just be so careful. <laughs> just be so careful about this bear, guys. You won't even believe it. Uh, anyways, yeah, so bear 1.5 miles. Uh, is was the second great thing that I saw <laughs> on this trip. All right. And then rounding it out, Dave, what is our fifth star of the week? So our fifth star of the week, Matt, is a little enigmatic for you, I imagine, because in our notes it just says BUMP in all caps. Yes, it does. Yeah. So BUMP is a new game. It's a hot new game. <laughs> that uh, So I invented it. I'm, I'm the progenitor of BUMP. Okay. And it started out as a cooperative game that you could play and the babies have turned bump into a competitive game okay so how bump started out is that you're holding a baby and they're sort of like waggling their head around and you're just like goofing around and so you tap them very gently on the forehead with your forehead and you say bump bump and then they giggle because you're bumping them with your forehead sure. right yeah so that's i had been playing that game with them and then a few days ago I noticed uh, one of them walk over to the other and just say, like, bump, bump. And then the other one said, bump. And then they just cracked their foreheads <laughs> together. And then, like, one of them fell down and then they both laughed. I mean, and so now, long as they're having fun. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is that, like, you can only play bump. Like, there's a very limited t amount of times that you can play bump. Before, like, somebody's crying. But this is just a game they play now. Beth was holding one of them. Uh, and Sugar Bean, she was holding her. And Sugar Bean says, like, bump, bump. And Beth said, no. And, uh, and Sugar Bean said, like, more, more, bump. And Beth was like, okay. And so Teresa, like, kind of reared back <laughs> and slammed her forehead into Beth. And then sort of, like fell like sort of leaned back and was like dizzily laughing and just like cackling and saying like bump ha 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 bump so uh so this is a new game that the babies have invented and it's just called bump and you can play it with them um but you you really gotta you really gotta sandbag you gotta them. be like, so you careful <laughs> yeah you gotta be so so careful when you're playing bump with the babies um you kind of have to let them win that's it. a real easy or at least you have to you have to let them defeat themselves. Like, you just have to be a sort of passive participant in Bump. Yeah, man, that seems like it's a game where it's real easy for everyone involved to lose. Yeah, you do have to be careful about Bump, but it's very, very funny. Uh, all right, man. Well, that is the five stars. We are going to take a break. We're going to watch episode 40, Arrival, The Mysterious Princess. And we will be right back. <laughs> Okay, welcome back. So we have just finished watching episode 40 of Cherokee Sentai O-Ranger. It is called Arrival, the Mysterious Princess. It was written by Noboru Sugimura. My computer is further away from my eyes than I thought it was going to be, and I had to squint for a second. Uh, Ooh. Now it's a small screen. Sure, let's go with that explanation. <laughs> Dave, I'm not... Listen, my eyes have been bad since I was like seven. Uh, I am not... That, You're not old not that, that one. That is not a thing that I'm like, oh man, no, I'm not old yet. My eyes are still fresh. Fresh like a baby hawk. <laughs> no, I just have a... But not like a super baby one. Like one that its eyes have opened. Yes. And that's a good uh, young hawk. Uh, no, it's just it's uh, a anyways. MacBook Air and it's like two feet away from my face. Okay, so uh, this episode, it's also a very accurately titled episode. Like, A Mysterious Princess definitely does arrive. Mm -hmm. like, that's totally true. Oh, yeah. So we open the episode up, and it is Hysteria on this, on this like, secret lab on this random planet where she has reunited with Emperor Bacchus. Well, ex-Emperor Bacchus Wrath, I guess. I guess it's just Bacchus now. Mr. Bacchus <laughs> Wrath. And he says, Hysteria... It's been some time. So I... I mean, it's been a few weeks. I mean, it has. It's been a, a little while. Listen, it's longer than I would survive as a head in a jar. So... Hey man, you don't know that. Give yourself some credit. 
<laughs> well, I guess I really what I would be giving is I don't know how good our our head jar technology is. Uh, so he says when O Ranger like destroyed me, my head alone escaped to this planet. This raises for me, Matt, just a lot of questions. Yeah, because because it's not clear as to whether or not this was some sort of plan of his, or if they just hit him so hard that his head hit like escape velocity and landed on a different planet. No, all of that I'm fine with. Like I don't care how his head got there. Like whatever. But there's like a fully functioning lab. His head is like hooked up to stuff. It's in a tube. This is the, like she did not just happen across his head sitting in a crater and it has somehow survived because of his like crazy robo power. This is like a setup. Like someone built this and all he says is my head escaped to this planet. I think he actually says somehow in that sentence. So like and is there an additional actor here that we have no idea and like they never reference it's Mr. Henna. Mr. <laughs> Henna has done this. He, he finally did enough robot research that he was able to compile this uh, research facility on another planet. There's that may as well no... be the answer because I don't think we're going to get a different one. I had assumed. I don't think we're going to get one. There's just a robo lab capable of sustaining the head of a robot empire for weeks. Okay. Just for nothing. What we hear. Here is what I had previously assumed, which was that he had set up this lab earlier, and this was some sort of, like, fail-safe thing that had been triggered when he was blown up. I do not now think that that is the case. My new thought is that his head is so powerful that when it landed on this planet, it was able to, like, send out, like, tendrils and energy beams to construct this whole thing around himself. Okay, I... I actually dig that a lot more. That's very cool. Yeah. The I like okay. Okay, no no no. Now I'm now that you say that, I'm actually pretty into it. Like the idea of this head like desperately using like energy powers and like servo tubes to like construct like a makeshift life support yeah. system for itself. Like that's that's pretty rad. Yeah, actually. like I wish we would have seen it a little bit, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty into that being it because we'll actually see a little later in the episode that just being a head in a jar, he is still capable of like controlling this entire facility. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so she says like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe hysteria does all of the stuff has happened. Uh, Bumble the Great killed our son, and she's like still holding his head. And Banka's wrath, he does like a little like eye beamy like laser scan, and he kind of looks into Bulldone's head and he says, "Oh, he's like, yeah, Bulldone's is fine, or he's yeah. not like fine, like, but his, his AI is undamaged. Yeah, like, he can be revived. Like the important part of him is is cool. Yeah. And then back now, this is very surprising to me because Banka's wrath then says, "Hey, listen, like I am alive now, but like I am not long for this world." Yeah, like, this is kind of... Like, I have managed to do... I'm scraping by I've, here, but this is it. I've managed to do all of this to stay alive until you've reached me, and I've got a little more juice left, but, like, I'm not coming back from this. Yeah. So I am going to use the last of my power to revive the universe's deadliest warrior, Prince Bulldone. Yes. Which right so now doesn't make a lot of sense. He definitely does say that thing. Yeah, I feel like this is like Robo Dementia setting in. Well, again, I mean, w give it a few minutes. If this will make sense, I promise. But just based yeah. on what we have seen of Bulldog, he was not even able to beat Bomber the Great. Uh, which is not to say that Bomber the Great is a slouch, but like... To go from uh, being killed immediately, the only time he's ever been in a real fight, to being called the greatest fighter in the universe, happened, like, in the course of one episode. Yeah, it's a very big jump. So, Bacchus Rath, Mr. Bacchus Rath, says, put Bulldog's head on that platform, and, like, I'm gonna do my thing. And then, uh... We get a neat shot where they just do it in reverse, like, they had the head on the thing, and they had a bunch of tubes connected to it, and then they pulled them away, and then they played the... 
the thing for us in reverse. So it looks like these tubes are kind of like snaking up and attaching to Bulldog's head. It's very so that's good. Cool. The, the bad thing about this is that when Empress Hysteria places Bulldog's head in the center of this pedestal, she places it like just to the left of the center. And there's like a circle in the middle of it. And she just doesn't quite get it inside that circle. Um, and it, like, the camera cuts away, and when it cuts back, like, his head is in the middle, but there is this moment, like, come on, man, like, you're rebuilding your son from, like, scrap parts and your husband's dying energy, at least make sure you get the, like, the placement right. (laughs) So... It's like a kerning uh, error on, like, a really high level. Um, so... (laughs) <laughs> There's a really good joke about kerning, but it's visual, so you have to. I mean, it just that makes says, sense. Yeah, um, it just says keming, and the de- the word is keming, and the definition is like when your kerning is off. <laughs> ah, see. Anyways, so uh, Emperor Miss, so I keep saying sorry, Miss, uh, Mister Mr. Wrath, Bacchus Wrath. <laughs> Mr. Wrath. So Mr. Wrath initiates a power transfer. So there's like yellow energy like flying all over the place and it's like flowing through the tubes and all of this stuff is happening. And then Hysteria says like, I'll do this too. I will also feed all of my power. And I assume she meant into Bulldo because she like <laughs> she glows with, because she, she, he's right there. And that's what we're doing in the moment. And she like glows with like purple electric energy and then she just kind of blasts it off into space. And she says that she's going to summon a new power. And, like, what happens is she su- she blasts all of this energy into space. And then, like, we see a comet sort of flying back towards our direction. Yeah. So we're not, again, like, we don't really know what's happening, but we do know what's happening. It's the mysterious princess. Right, there's an arrival of a mysterious princess. Yeah, it's, yeah. So we go from there... To it just was like this really weird moment because she's like, I'll do it too. And, and then, then she, she like shoots all of her energy into space and does a totally different thing. So we go back and uh, we've got the gold blockers. So remember, the beckoning dog is turning the O blocker robo. O blocker robo is the O block. The blocker robo. Yes. Yeah. Turning like parts of them into gold. So they're, they're having trouble because obviously they're not designed to be lifting this enormously heavy metal. Uh, he, the beckoning dog shoots a beam at Star Blocker who kind of like dodges back. Uh, but Bama the Great, he's loving this. He is, he's like, I got this in the bag. He's kind of making fun of them. He's like, you guys, like, this is it. Like, my, my beckoning dog, Gold Beams, have defeated you. I'm going to beat all your robots. This is it for Earth. Yeah. And then Acha and Coach are Bama the Great up. forever. And Acha and Coach are like, hey, man, Bama, Bama the Great, love you. You're the best. Love it. Love everything Bama you're doing. Bama the Great forever. Um, I had an idea, though. Because what you're doing right now, just turning everything on Earth into gold, that's cool. But you know what's cooler than gold? Is a giant gold palace. Like a really giant gold palace. And to illustrate this, I have painted you an illustration of what it might look like. And it is truly gigantic. It's so large that they have suggested using the blocker robos as... Like gate decorations, yeah, for this thing. It's it's huge. And what Acha and Coach so recommend is like, hey, we've turned all this stuff into gold, melted down into gold bricks, build a thing. But the the creepiest thing about this is that they say, yeah, melt down like the park bench and the bicycle and the buildings and the you know and all this stuff. Also, the people that we have turned into gold, melt them down too. It's all just gold. Just everybody, just everyone, everything. And Bomber the Great loves this plan he loves it he just says and so he sort of like turns to the beckoning dog and he's like make more gold he's like turn everybody into gold like just get crazy you've got gold making beams yeah. don't hold he's back he's the man with the Midas gold touch gold everywhere yeah. a spider's touch so we such a cold hey, finger uh, <laughs> I don't I would love to do this gag with you Matt I don't know the lyrics to gold no, he beckons you in, into his web of sin but don't give in Pretty words who will say in your ear, I think. You just let me know when it's time to say Goldfinger, because that's the only line I know. Uh, it, it, it would take a while for me to get back to Goldfinger, sadly. Okay. Uh, do you ever, no, do you that's Goldfinger? Goldfinger. That's the only bit yeah. I know. So uh, we go down to the the feet of the beckoning dog statue, and we see the Barra soldiers have they just gotten like a 
a pickup truck, which is pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're just kind of picking up golden people. There's some really nice statue work going on. Like people are staying very stiff and statue-like oh, yeah. as they're being picked up and moved by the Barra soldiers. And uh, Shohei, though, he's still kind of trying to, like, stumble his way yeah, if you, over if to, you rec- to try and help. If you'll recall from the previous episode, his legs have been turned into gold um, up to an indistinct point because it looks like it's just from the knees down, but he also does not seem to be able to, like, move his hips well. Well, I mean, gold is very, very heavy. That's true. Like, really heavy. So, you know, anyways, um, so Acha and Kocha are just kind of, they're like, well, you're here, but you can't really do anything. So they just send some Barra soldiers over to pick up Shohei. Uh, he tries to henshin, but right as he is about to do it, his bracer and his arms get hit by the gold beam as well. So now his arms are leg and his legs are... Gl- his arms are legs. His, his arms, arms are gold. And his legs, legs are gold. And his legs are his arms, are, and they're all gold. And they're all gold. So is the point. All of his limbs are now gold, but his head and torso are not. And he is also being thrown in the truck to get tossed into the smelting pit, which is horrifying for everyone, but has to be even more horrifying for Shohei, right? Well, I don't know because we're going to see later on in the episode when uh, spoilers, everybody gets saved, and this show does not dump people into a smelting pit. <laughs> uh, th- they all seem to be aware of what was happening. So I-, I think that everybody is like fully conscious while they are gold, which is horrifying. I, I think that might be a literal nightmare I've had. So uh, the Rangers kind of don't know what to do because they're in their block of robos. They can't really pilot them but they also can't afford to just leave them because if they leave them, then that's definitely it. But now Shohei is getting dragged away in this truck and like just, you know, kind of what do they do? They're not really sure. Goro, who up until this point has managed to avoid all of the gold sh- beams, is distracted enough by Shohei's abduction that he gets nailed too. Yeah. So now all the O blocker, the blocker robots that were in play are, they're out. Right. Like they're all non functional They are at least partially gold. But yeah, the one you know who's not is I keep wanting to say it's the Gold Ranger, which would be great for this episode. But it's not the Gold Ranger because that was from no, Power it's, Rangers. It's Ricky, the King yeah. Ranger. Yeah, he's the King Ranger. So he arrives in King Pyramider, and uh, Bear the Great, Bomb of the Great's like, "What's happening?" And he's just like, "I've come to stop you." God. So there's like a C does a super crazy lightning attack, like the one that starts off as a laser shooting from the top of the pyramid, and then it turns into a lightning bolt and kind of like launches along the ground. Um, King Pyramid, rules. yeah, it's very good. Uh, so he does the super lightning attack, and it hits the beckoning dog, and like the outer shell crumbles, and inside is, in fact, a giant baranoia, uh, is a bara beast. It's bara gold. Yeah, and at this point, Goro says, oh, man, that was a giant robot of the log. And, like, yeah, man, what did you think it was? <laughs> yeah, well, Bar the Great just says, like, oh, yeah, of course. Of course it was. I'm not totally sure what he's supposed to be. I think he might supposed to, it's kind of like a mining like a mining thing? It's honestly hard to see because the beckoning dog had these big floppy ears and... And like they had to build... Oh, okay. So I'm looking at the... Matt, I'm looking at the uh, the concept art for it. And what it is is that like the head of the beckoning dog is sort of the torso of Barra Gold. Like it has big... It's sort of like a cross between like a dog... And a mining steam engine. Okay. Like one arm is like a hammer hook, and the other arm is like kind of a drilly sorty thing. And then the chest is like a big dog snout. And then like the ears are coming off the shoulders. Gotcha. It's it's kind of an abstract concept. I will admit. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, he's not in the episode for a very long time. Yeah, no, he's not. Um So so uh, Goro, now that like the tide is starting to turn, he's like, oh yeah, right, I have a whole other robot. So he summons Red Puncher. And then at this point, 
like the fight is a little more even because for some reason maybe the gold powers were only when he was in like the beckoning dog form and did not exist in the bara gold form because he seems to stop uh doing all of the gold stuff at this point yeah that it was kind of a weird yeah i mean like i cuz it would be boring if he just did that again right like so... they need to beat this guy so we go from there, and we see the truck, and it's full of gold people, and the kid, whose name I don't remember, uh, but the mom and dad's kid, he's following on his bike, and Ancha and Kocha, they pull them over to this gold foundry. So they've got this little conveyor belt, like a series of conveyor belts, uh, and they are just putting stuff on the conveyor belt that is all made out of gold and, and moving it towards this smelter. So I guess, yeah, the plan is they're going to make gold bricks or or something um gold isn't like structurally sound so i i don't really know what their plan i mean is for I that don't know. it is if you have enough of it well i mean it's structurally sound to make like a very large pile of gold you could definitely do that with it but like i mean you can't make girders out of the stuff yeah but if you turn everything on earth into gold you can just like Make you know stack it up so its wall is like ten feet thick. I I mean yeah I I guess uh, I mean it's a terrible it's idea. Like a but... Weird doorway. Listen, Acha and Kocha are toady robots. They're not expert architects, so let's just roll with that. Right. So like Acha um... made a very nice painting of a palace, and he was like, "Oh, dude, I bet we could talk him into this. This is gonna be BCG great. He's gonna love it." So Shoei is on the conveyor belt, and uh, he is. Like, you know, obviously he's freaking out. I think this is actually the best acting we have seen from from this guy um, He does uh, so far. This is not the first time we've mentioned it. He's a very good, like, he's great with his face. Yeah, he's extremely expressive. That's the so word I was really looking for. So feel the terror, yeah. It's okay, Matt. I'm a professional. <laughs> so, uh... The kid arrives, and I, I thought he was about to run in to save Shohei, and I think he would have. I'm going to give him enough credit to say that he would have. But then a manhole pops up next to him, and Gunmagin arrives. Yeah, so Gunmagin has just been hanging in out in giant the sewer. robot forms. Yeah, so Gunmagin arrives in his like tiny head statue form, and he appears next to the kid, and then the key is there, and then Gunmagin says. You've got to say gun, gun doka, gun something, something, whatever the magic phrase is. Yeah. And you've got to put the key in. Which, okay, gun imagine, if you want to do some stuff, you can just do it. Right. As, as previously established, there is no ruling body for gun imagine. And it's not like he gives you some challenge where you have to find the key. Like, he arrives, he gives you the key. He tells you how to use the key, and then he's like, okay, now what's up? Now I can intervene. And, it's just the weirdest set of rules. And clearly, the he already wanted to intervene of. because he's here. Right. The only thing I can think of is that he is under some, like, ancient Gaius. Like, some magical binding that's like, you can only do it if, like, someone tells you they wish for it. But like, there's but the person who put the gas on him didn't think to put restrictions on like how to go about the wishing is, yeah, and and that also that he didn't have to accept every wish, and so he's just figured out like, oh, well, I can only do it if someone asks me to, but I can kind of make that happen however I feel like I need to. So, um, so the kid dies, and mm -hmm. then Gun Imagine transforms and he's like what do you wish for like wink nudge and the kid says i wish you could save everyone and gun imagine's like great job i'm on it <laughs> so he rolls so, in uh, uh shohei is shrieking because he is about to fall into a pit of molten gold yeah uh gun imagine arrives and just like monologues for a second while people are inching closer and closer to death uh and then Ancha and Kocha, like, as soon as they see Gun Imagine, Ancha and Kocha are gone. Well, there is a moment where Ancha's butt gets caught on fire, and that's extremely good. Oh, that's good. a very funny, yes, that's very, very good. And uh, Shohei is saved at, like, literally, you know, like, of course. He's about to fall in, and the conveyor belt stops, and Gun Imagine is there and, and has saved him. 
So we go from there back to the robot fight. Yes. And Goro has discovered by like casual observation, because this was super yeah, obvious. for no reason. That the like the thing that is do, like shooting out the gold lasers are the things that were back when it was the beckoning dog, the eyes. So now there's just like two yeah. like I think like two red things on his shoulders. I didn't get a great look at it, but well, again, if you look at the, like the concept, are they're still supposed to be the eyes? They're just kind of like they're funky looking. Yeah. So so he says, aim for the eyes. Like that's that's what's the source of his power, I guess. Yeah, and I thought this was going to kill him, but it absolutely does not. But they do manage to knock out the gold power. And when they do that, not only does he lose the ability to turn things into gold, everything that had been previously transformed into gold goes back to its original state. Yeah, it's like some sort of gold uh, like circuit, right? right? Like once you can, once you deal with that, like everybody's fine. Um, so... Okay, they, so they do that. Quick, Great job. Quick thought experiment. What if they had melted down like the entire city of Tokyo and used that gold to build a giant golden palace, and then something had happened to Barra Gold, and you know he just like fell down a hill and cracked his head and like broke that thing? What would then happen to this castle? Would it just still uh, be a huge castle made out of like building parts and bicycles? Uh, flesh palace, Matt. You're going to end up with a flesh palace, is what you've got. Well, Dave, I was specifically avoiding that angle on things, but sure. Well, listen, man, you were the one who said, like, what if Shohei hadn't turned into gold, and then he was a brick? So that's flesh bricks. That's what you get. You made that happen. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So, Thank you, O-Ranger. Um, Thank you for this gift. Thank you for this nightmare <laughs> gift. <laughs> So, um, I'm pretty sure that makes an appearance on, like, Vampire the Masquerade somewhere. Uh, so, like, they knock out the bo- the gold power, and then, like, then uh, Red Puncher is in it. So, he's like, Puncher Gatling, which uh, always reminds me of Gundam Heavy Arms, which I love. And then he does Magna Puncher, so, like, great. Um, the kid is reunited with his parents because, like, we go back to the factory. The kids reunited with the parents. Everybody that was about to be melted down is saved. They're like, "Hooray!" and they all run away. So Shohei like runs out, and even though the gold power is knocked out, like gold bar of gold is still uh, he's you know he's a firecracker. Yeah, I was really and so su- they're still having trouble with this dude. I was very surprised at this point in the episode because I really thought that after Red Puncher did all that stuff, Bar of Gold was just dead. So, yeah, well, yeah, I had assumed so as well, but he is not. Um, so then Shohei rolls up. He's like, guys, I'm here. They somehow hear him. He henshins. He summons. They actually summon uh, the Choriki Mobiles. Well, because, okay, here's what happens. I was not expecting. Is that Bar Gold is still alive, and he has another set of weapons that are like these giant chains. And those chains have wrapped up all the O-blockers. So the O yes. blockers are there, but they're immobile. And they're like, well, we've just got, like, now that Shohei is here, we can summon all five of the original Cherokee mobiles, and we can use those to build O Ranger Robo. He's got a giant sword. He can cut the chains and free the O blockers. Uh, yes, which is, which is actually, yeah, precisely what happened. So now all of the giant robots are in play. Like, Ricky is there, the, o- the blockers are there. O-Ranger Robo is there. Red Puncher is there. Like, all the toys that you can buy, except for Tackle Boy, weirdly. Yeah, I actually had totally forgotten about the existence of Tackle hey, Boy. Hey, did we get Tackle Boy more than twice? It feels I like we, we should we have. Tackle Boy. I don't know if we got Tackle Boy more than once. Yeah, he has not been a huge part of this show, and that is kind of disappointing to me. Yeah, that's a real bummer. I was super looking forward to more Tackle Boy. Anyway, so the Cherokee Mobiles, like, join with the uh, King Pyramider to form the, like, the giant battle mode. Uh, and they zap Gold uh, gold Bricks. No, that's not his name. Uh, Byragold. Yeah, sure, whatever. With the uh, Super Legend Beam. And that is the end of him, because it is that beam is both super and legendary. Yeah, it's um, it's very, very large. And we do get the great shot where we just see how absolutely ridiculously gigantic the battle formation of King Pyramider and the Choriki Mobiles is. Mm-hmm. Like, 
It's huge. Like, it's ridiculously huge. Yeah, like, if you had that toy as a child, it probably took up a lot of your bedroom. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Uh, okay, so... So, Bama the Great's still in the mix, right? Like, he never went giant, but he is still there. And the kid still has the key. And Gun Manjin's like, okay, well, we've dealt with this situation. Now what? The kid says, ah, that guy, Bama the Great... He bullied all my friends and was very mean. Like, you should go punish him. And he says, sounds good. Yes. Love that plan. So he runs off after them. And so Bomber the Great's running away from uh, Gun Majin. He is then confronted by the O-Rangers. And then sort of on the other side, like, so all three are converging on him. Ricky shows up. And so he's trying to get away from them. And then he looks up. And if you recall... Aside from Tackle Boy, all of their giant robots are there. So it's every hero and all the giant robots just surrounding Bomber the Great as he is, like, really coming to grips with the fact that this is a bad situation for him. Yeah, uh, they're slowly advancing on him. And then all of a sudden, there is this, like, intense, powerful rumbling. And then there's, like, lightning and a fireball and an explosion and, like, all sorts of crazy stuff. And what we see is this lady robot. Right. Well, this is... With, like, a... We see the comet that uh, Empress Hysteria oh, that's right. Summoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whoever this is, like, this is what Empress Hysteria was up to. And it is a lady bot with, like, a really cool, like, how, like super energy bow that like a it's a physical bow that fires energy lasers. It's actually a really neat uh, look. Like it looks very cool. Yeah. So she does that. Like she's shooting uh, energy arrows at them. The arrows are like multiplying in midair. They're exploding when they hit. Everybody's thrown for a loop. Like even Gun Magin is thrown for a loop. Uh, she turns into a fireball and like blasts through everybody. Reland. She's like up on like a, a perch, like a mountain. Well, they're in the quarry. So she's like up on like the top of the hill and she's like backlit and like firing down at everybody. And then she does this like a lightning whip attack thing. Uh, she, it's everything she's doing looks super radical. Yeah. And the, the and, look, oh, oh, her name. Okay. Well, let's just say how we find out her well, name. Well, she's about to say, Goro runs up and he's like, who are you? And she just laughs. And she says, I am Princess M- Multiwa. Multiwa. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's a weird name. I have it in my notes as Multiwa, um, but yeah, I, it, it, I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced. I feel like it's gotta have something to do with like a like a like wattage or something. I, I genuinely have no idea. But we cut back to um, Mister Bacchus Rath's uh, science lab, and Empress Hysteria is like, "Oh yeah, that's my niece. I have summoned her." So I guess what so she, this I guess what is a whole new series of questions. Right. So I guess Empress Hysteria has like like what she did wasn't to create anything. It was to like summon someone from like a different galaxy. Right? Yeah, I I guess. Now, how does like if Bacchus Wrath made Empress Hysteria does that mean that he also made, like, a full family for Empress Hysteria, and this is part of that? It must be, right? And, like, that was part of the Baranoia Empire that, like, is not on the battlefront. Yeah, it's just, like, like right. that's the that's the they're old country. The back. Like, they're... Yeah, that, no, that totally makes sense to me. Um... So then the next, yeah, so that's that's basically it. Um, well, I mean, there's one more Well, she says, thing all here. my... Yeah, she says that all my power is hers now. Uh, so that was it for, for that bit. Yeah. Um, and then Bacchus Wrath, he like sends the last of his power into Bulldown and his head tube sort of explodes and his head flies over and Empress Hysteria, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I guess Miss, Mrs. Hysteria. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs. Hysteria picks it up and he says, like, I've done it. But but this is it. Like the rest is up to you. And then like his and we actually get this sort of oddly tender moment between uh Mr. Rath and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. Rath, I guess. Where like we do get a sense that there was on some level like this relationship that they had. Yeah, like she's really, really sad that he's dead. Even though love 
like love between the Cactus Brothers was totally forbidden, there is genuine affection between the members of the royal family. Yeah, Bacchus Wrath is great, man. Uh, or was great, yeah. I guess. I, I yeah, was well, really yeah, so not he's... expecting to like him as much as I did in this show. Uh, but he's he was great, but now he's gone. But Dave, his power has created something far greater. And he, is, yes. and he has given us such a beautiful gift. Because now we don't have to look at Prince Voldo anymore. Yes. So the next thing that we see is that Prince Voldo has like transformed into a, a fancy boy basically well, he's got a, he's got a tricorner hat uh he's yeah. he's got sort of like wings like small decorative wing like shoulder pad things and sort of like a jacket looking deal it's a very good look um in i was watching the like next episode on o ranger and i see that he is going to be going by the name uh kaiser Bulldont, which is so good Ooh, yeah, that's definitely way better. Okay, no, Dave, here's the weird thing about um, the existence of Kaiser Bulldog. In Power Rangers Zeo, this is not Bulldog. This is a separate character called Prince Gasket, who was like... No kidding! Who was Bulldog's older brother who has like come back from exile. Because I guess in Power Rangers Zeo, the way that they played it is that Bulldog... Or, I'm sorry, uh, he was called... Uh, I forget what it was called. Whatever, like, the Bulldog version was in there. Actually, it might have been Gasket. I'm getting the names wrong. But in any case, like, that character doesn't die. But after there's the stuff with um, Bomber the Great, there are these new characters who come in who are Archerina and Prince Gasket, who are, like, you know, uh, Princess Multiwa and Kaiser Bulldog. Oh, and so okay. yeah, they yeah, yeah, sort of but... take over... But they continue to use footage of, like, the original form of him and have them just be separate characters who are brothers. That is wild. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other option, though, is what? Like, you show the scene where the little kid robot gets decapitated? Like, that does not seem like the sort well, of thing I mean, that would have been they Fox did it, Kids. They did it in Japan, yeah, so... Yeah, but Fox so Kids, whatever. man. Uh, yeah, okay, good point. Uh... So then I think that basically is it for, for this episode. Yeah, that is going to do it for that episode, Dave. But it's not going to do it yet for our episode, because first, we need to determine where uh, Barra Gold fares in the Creature Royale. Okay, well, I think the strongest thing Barra Gold has going for them is that his, his power slash, like, his plan, and I don't even, I hesitate to even sort of call it his plan, uh... It's a very, like, it's a very cool, weird, unique plan. Right. Like, we haven't seen one like this before. And, and I, I dig that. I dig unique monsters. Mm -hmm. um, and also, think, think about the fact that at some point, like, he did become a giant robot. But at some point, he was a very small robot. Like, he was a, a teeny, very, very tiny, tiny robot, robot inside that tiny him. dog. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, but ultimately, he is one of those robot or one of those villains that is a cool idea that works well in the episode. Um, that is even like fun and unique. But it's he doesn't manage to be his own character. He doesn't have a personality, which can be which right. can be fine. But you know, like that's a whole set of bonus points that he doesn't have access to. So, where about are you starting to look on this list? And, you know, I think that where that, where I'm going to start looking then is at uh, number 85 on our list, Snake Armor. Because it's another thing that, like, it was a cool, he had a cool power, and he affected, like, the people around him in a very neat way. He was an interesting fight uh, and all that stuff. But it was just a living suit of armor, right? There's no character to that. But the hook of it was so good that it did pretty well on the list. No, it's number 85. No, it's I, not doing super it's great. It's not amazingly well. No, that I think is a really good place to start because as soon as they start looking above that, I'm starting to see Nurakabe and Bara clothes. And I think actually they are examples of the same thing but better. Because like Nurakabe is a weird thing, but he does have some personality. Yeah, Nurakabe, if so you I don't recall, was the the guy from Cocker Ranger. Who, oh, yeah, he's the wall monster yeah. from, from Cocker Ranger. So I would say, I actually think I like Barra Gold better than better than Snake Armor. Man, Snake Armor was really good, though. Remember that episode? It was like the two 
warriors from another dimension who could turn anything into a weapon? Yeah, but that's really about them. Um, no, I do dig snake armor, but I think Gold is cooler. He's like powered by human green. He's got a force field. And I will also say he's way more effective than snake armor. Yeah. Baragold is not kidding around. No, snake armor does look cooler. That is without a doubt. Uh, yeah, he definitely, definitely does. Uh, but okay, if you if, mm. if you feel that strongly about it, I am willing to uh, give that to you. We can put him... Do you want to put him right above Snake Armor? I would say just above him, because Karakasa is uh, the Umbrella Monster from Cock Ranger is also very yeah, cool. Yeah, the second Umbrella Monster. The first one was not as good. Yeah, the, the second one. This, the, the first one sucked. Um, okay, so Barra Gold is now our new spot number 85, and that, Matt, is going to do it for this episode. Uh, yes, it is, Dave. It will do it for another episode of For Your Eyes, O Ranger. Before we finish up here, I would like to remind you all you can email the show at supersentibrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're mentioning on Twitter, uh, we are at Super Sentai Bros. If you like the show, and I hope that you do, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Rate, review, subscribe on there. That's what's going to help new people find the show. Or just tell somebody. Just tell a friend. Or an acquaintance. A co-worker. You know. If you're just around in the world and it seems relevant, bring it up. Who knows? Couldn't hurt, right? Definitely couldn't hurt. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. Uh, if you would like to listen to any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can do so at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Once again, we are the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth.